The makers of Campbell Soups present The Campbell Playhouse. Orson Welles, producer. Good evening, this is Orson Welles. Tonight I present you Miss Helen Hayes in Victoria Regina. And of course, this is my proudest moment since I've been producing these broadcasts. For tonight, the Campbell Playhouse brings you, for the first time on the air, the American theater's foremost success in this decade, and in it, one of the truly great performances of our time. Hundreds of thousands of you have seen Miss Hayes as Victoria in your playhouses all over this continent. I know you're with us now. It's our special privilege to bring her to the millions more of you who have no theaters, who have radios. I hope we're worthy of the privilege. First, a word from Ernest Chappell. I was thinking just last night about a birthday dinner I had at my grandfather's farm years ago when I was a little boy. It was a great event, that visit, a glorious adventure. Grandpa and I drove up from the station in the buggy, and he and Granny hustled me through the kitchen so that I shouldn't see the good things she was fixing. But one whiff of the aroma from Granny's cook stove, and I knew that there would be roast chicken for dinner. And what a chicken it was, too. Cooked to a tempting russet brown and just falling apart under Grandfather's carving knife. I stayed overnight, and the next day, Granny made a pot of chicken soup. It shone like gold, that soup, and I remember that I thought it was the finest soup I'd ever tasted. These memories came back to me last night when I had chicken soup with the same glowing look, the same tempting aroma, and the same wonderful flavor. This was Campbell's chicken soup. And I can tell you that Campbell's is the kind of chicken soup that grandmother made so well. Nourishing soup, heartwarming, and chicken tasting to the last spoonful. Into its making goes all the good meat of tender chickens and fluffy, perfectly cooked rice and melting tender pieces of chicken meat, too. And so I say, as sure as you like chicken, you like Campbell's chicken soup. Won't you make a point of having it this weekend? And now for our Campbell Playhouse production of Victoria Regina, starring Helen Hayes with Orson Welles. For this broadcast tonight, Orson Welles has prepared a script which contains not only the great scenes from the successful stage production, but some of the episodes from the original play which have never yet been seen in the theater. And to complete the true picture of this great queen, Mr. Welles has used still another source, one which only a few years ago was still a closed book, locked away in the official archives of the royal family. The Personal Diary of Queen Victoria. Sometimes hard for us to understand now what Victoria meant to Victorians. Most of her subjects had never known another sovereign. And when this star of England fell out of the skies, the whole firmament was suddenly a little hard to believe. Everything changed, of course. But England and its empire, and indeed the whole world, waited a decent time after her death. For her imperial majesty, Victoria, by the grace of God, Queen of the United Kingdom, of Great Britain and Ireland, Defender of the Faith, Empress of India, was moreover, by the grace of God, the absolute monarch of a whole way of life, the defender of a viewpoint of a dignity that left the world with her. England grew a lot under her reign, as much as she could make it, and changed as little as she could help. Canterbury and Lord Melbourne are here to see Her Royal Highness on important business. Yes, my lord. Hurry, man, hurry. Uh, yes, my lord, but uh, I'll have to call the maid first. Mm-hmm. Well, then call her, please. Yes, Your Grace, but uh, the maid's sleep where I'm not supposed to go, and the door actually is locked. I shall have to throw stones up at the window. Isn't there a bell? Yes, my lord. In Her Royal Highness, the Duchess's room, there is a bell. Well, go and ask that it may be rung. Then go to Her Royal Highness, the Duchess's room, my lord. Not now. Her Royal Highness, the, the princess is there. Well, too. go and do the best you can. Only hurry. 
and say Her Royal Highness must come. Yes, my lord. Good lord, what a house. So the uh, princess sleeps with the old cat, does she? I beg your pardon? I, I beg yours, yes. I suppose one oughtn't to say that now. But your grace knows the Duchess has been a difficulty all along. Yes, my lord, we know. Uh, have you not better sit down? We may have to wait, you know. If that man's stone-throwing is not good, we may have to wait a long time. So this is how history gets written. This won't get into history, my lord. No, I suppose not. Oh, it's a pity, you know, a pity. I don't know what to think of it. It meaning what? Female on the throne. King would have been so much better. I don't know, my lord. Heirs male of the last generation have not been a conspicuous success. No English king has been a conspicuous success since Edward I. Yet the monarchy has gone on. Yes, but it's gone off. His late majesty was a conspicuous example of it. Uh, you wouldn't believe the trouble we sometimes had with him. They say you can make a donkey go by tying a carrot in front of its nose. Well, he was like a donkey with a carrot tied to its tail. Uh, really? Was hmm. he just a little, uh, like his father, you know? Mad, eh? No, not mad. It was the shape of his head, I think. Uh, it was pear-shaped, you know, just like a pear. The weakest fruit drops earliest to the ground, Sir Shakespeare. But his head was weak fruit, distinctly amazing how it hung on. One can't exactly say lost it. I beg your pardon, my lord. Yes? My lord. Well? Her Royal Highness, my lord. I went in... But her Royal Highness was asleep. Well, you must wake her Royal Highness up then. Such a beautiful sleep, my lord. I didn't like it. Even the most beautiful sleep must give way to affairs of state. You know who I am? Yes, my lord. You know his grace? Yes, my lord. Then go at once. Wake her Royal Highness and tell her that we are here, waiting for an audience. Six o'clock. There's to be a council at ten. Where? Here? At St. James's, I think. No. Perhaps it will have to be here. She mustn't appear in public yet. It wouldn't be quite decent. People might cheer. Well, here's somebody coming. Madam. Your Grace, my lord, you have news for us? For Her Royal Highness, the princess, we have news for oh, the king then... Is dead. Then my daughter is dead. Uh... Queen. <sighs> she has come then at last. And I am the queen mother. No, madam. Your Royal Highness is not the queen mother. Not? Your Royal Highness is the queen's mother. That's the distinction. Only had your Royal Highness been queen in the first place with that other title now follow. Then if it is not mine by your law, she shall give it to me. That, madam, I fear will be impossible. Oh, I shall go myself and speak to her at once. That shall send Madam, we are here to see Her Majesty the Queen on urgent business. We must not be delayed. Your presence at the interview, madam, will not be required unless Her Majesty sends for you. Oh, this is not to be borne. Your Grace, she's coming. Madam, if you will leave us, please, for a moment. For a moment only. But my own daughter. Madam, please. <gasps> It is our painful duty to announce to your majesty the death of his majesty, King William, following upon which sad event. By right of succession, your majesty is now sovereign queen of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. Defender of the faith. We beseech almighty God, by whom kings and queens do reign, to bless the royal princess Victoria with long and happy years to reign over us. Your majesty. Your majesty. child, my child, oh, my child. Those gentlemen came to tell me that I am queen. Yes, you are queen at last. But really queen now? Before I've been crowned? Yes, now at once. The king is dead. You are queen. Then my reign has already begun. I can do as I like. Yes, as you like. Do not mind what anyone says. If you want to do it, do it. Oh, then, Mama, there is something I would like. Oh, yes, say it. It shall be done. How strange. That it should all have happened so suddenly. Yes, so <laughs> suddenly, after we've waited so long. But now, my love, do not stay here to catch cold. Come back to your own mother's bed. No, Mama, dear. As I may now do as I like, I wish in future to have a bed and a room of my own. Of your own? Yes, please, Mama. So? You have been waiting for that? I should be very glad, if you don't mind, now that I am my own mistress. Yes. Yes, I would rather be alone. My glad? Alone? Good night, Mama. Oh, heavens. What is going to become of me? journal, 
Thursday, June 20th, 1 p.m. Since it has pleased Providence to place me in this royal station, I shall do my utmost to fulfill my duties towards my country. I am very young, and perhaps in many, though not in all things, inexperienced. But I am sure that there are very few who have more real goodwill and more real desire to do what is fit and right than I have. At nine came Lord Melbourne, whom I saw in my room, and of course quite alone, as I shall always do all my ministers. He kissed my hand. He was in full dress. I like him very much and feel confidence in him. He is a very straightforward, honest, clever, and good man. You said yesterday, Your Majesty, with a courage which I thought remarkable in one so young. Someday we must marry. Yes. Has Your Majesty given that matter any further thought? Oh, yes, Lord Melbourne. I've thought of it a great deal. Is Your Majesty prepared yet to take me into Your Majesty's gracious confidence? You mean... As to the possible recipient of so overwhelming an honor. Oh, I have not thought of any person in particular. I mean, I've made no decision. I am relieved to hear it, ma'am. Then Your Majesty has still an open mind. An open mind? Oh, of course, I shall make my own choice, Lord Melbourne. Oh, well, of course, ma'am. Mm. I will not suggest otherwise for a moment. And there are some things as to which I am quite resolved. As for instance? My marriage, Lord Melbourne, must be a marriage of affection. That, I am sure, ma'am, can be arranged without difficulty. Someone I mean whose character I can respect. One whom I can love and look up to. Uh, look up to? Yes. It may sound strange to you, Lord Melbourne, but I must have as my husband one whom I can eventually look up to when I have trained him for the position he will have to occupy. Oh, quite so, quite so. I trust that such a person will be found. And as Your Majesty has owned to an open mind on the subject... I have here with me a list of possibles. Oh, Lord Melvin, how interesting. How many? Well, at present, ma'am, only five. But more are coming. Coming? That is, I'm making inquiries about them. What kind of inquiries? All kinds of inquiries, ma'am. I would not wish to present your majesty with one to whom there could be any possible objection. And you've already found five, Lord Melvin. How clever of you. I would like to see your list, Lord Melvin. Thank you. Do I know any of them? Your Majesty knows one of them very well. Oh, yes, I see. I did. But I... I couldn't marry my cousin George. He's so... so... Nobody wishes to decide Your Majesty's choice. There are others. But it is for me to decide, is it not? It is for Your Majesty to decide. Your Majesty need not marry at all. Oh, I must marry. Mama always said so. Then I shall say no more, ma'am. I will only commend the matter to Your Majesty's good sense and conscience. But Lord Melbourne... You haven't yet shown me any portraits. Portraits, ma'am? Why, portraits? I can't decide on anyone until I know what they are like. It wouldn't be fair to them or to me. Uh, portraits are sometimes deceptive, ma'am. Uh, court painters like prime ministers know their duty, and they only do what is expected of them. If they can't do that, they have to go. Here is a portrait that was sent to Mama the other day. It's of my cousin, Prince Albert of saxe gotha uh, may I see it? Uh, oh, oh, yes. Surely he must have grown very handsome. It wouldn't be possible for a court painter to imagine anyone like that. Do you think so, Lord Melbourne? Uh, you never know, ma'am. You never know. Imagination sometimes goes a long way. Well, am I now to make a collection of portraits for your majesty? Oh, no, Lord Melbourne. I wasn't speaking seriously when I said that. No more was I, ma'am. But I do ask your majesty to think seriously. The future welfare of this country is now in this little hand of yours. Indeed, Lord Melbourne. I pay great attention to everything that you tell me, and I shall continue to take your advice whenever I find it possible. My dear Lord Melbourne. <laughs> Thursday, October 10th, 1839. Today at half past seven, I went to the top of the staircase and received my two dear cousins, Ernst and Albert of saxe gotha whom I found grown and changed and embellished. It was with some emotion that I beheld Albert, who is beautiful. Friday, October 11th. Albert really is quite charming and so excessively handsome and such beautiful blue eyes and exquisite nose and such a pretty mouth as delicate mustachios, and slight but very slight whiskers. A beautiful figure, broad in shoulders, and a fine waist. 
about half past ten, dancing began. I danced five quadrilles. The first with them, the second with dearest Albert, who dances so beautifully, and the third with Lord Henry, and the fourth with Ernst, and the fifth with dearest Albert again. It is quite a pleasure to look at Albert when he collapses and waltzes. He does it so beautifully, holds himself so well with that beautiful figure of his. Well, Albert. You want to do that? We must speak English. Why? For practice. One of us, you or I, will have to always. I suppose. Which of us do you suppose it is going to be? Well, that is not for me to say. The decision will not be ours. But we shall have to say something. One of us, presently. Yes, presently. And our only one answer will be possible. You mean that it must be yes? Since it cannot possibly be no. <laughs> you don't seem very happy about it, no? Well, Aunt, the English do not like foreigners. Indeed? Oh, they like ruling them. They, <laughs> they do that as a favor. Here you or I will only be a puppet kept to breed by if it is you, are you going to resign yourself to that willingly? If it is to be me, you say. It is time that I speak, Albert. It must be me. Did not Papa tell you? Oh, did tell me? No, what? Well, perhaps he found it more difficult to tell you, I don't know, but this is quite sure. He wishes it shall be me. You? You're sorry? Well, that's why you made me come. Oh, well, she has to choose. Yes, she has to choose, but she has to choose me. Why? It is Papa's wish. He says that there are family reasons. If she asks me, I shall accept. And I must see that my father's wishes are obeyed. If you do not conform to his wishes, I shall have you sent home. Sent home? Yes, at once. You shall be ordered to return. I shall send word today. And what if I refuse to go? My dear Albert, we are not English. We are German. If the Duke, our father, our sovereign prince, sends for you to return, you will return. You know that perfectly well. Well, about that we shall see. Yes, Albert. What are you two looking so serious about? Oh, the rain. Oh, it will clear presently. And then we will go for a ride in the park. Oh, that will be very nice, to be sure. I hope you are going to enjoy your stay, cousin. Very much. I shall find it quite delightful. And you too, Albert. You're very kind, dear cousin. I... How could I help enjoying myself while I'm with you? Albert, that's the first pretty speech you have ever made me. Oh, I'm sorry, cousin. Oh, I like it. I, I mean that it should be only the first. <laughs> well, so long as it isn't the last, I don't mind. Uh, the rain is clearing. It's yes. stopped. Shall we go out now? Cousin Ernst, I've made all necessary arrangements. We will go out when we do go out and not before. Besides, have you practiced your music yet? I'm told at home you practice every day. Yes, but uh, here one cannot find the time. Go and do it now and there will be time. Well, I, I tried one of the pianos the day we arrived, cousin. It was not in very good tune. Oh, that doesn't matter. You will be all alone. No one will hear you. Well, generally, when we practice, Albert and I practice together. Duets, you mean? Yes. But if the piano's out of tune, duets would sound dreadful. No, Ernst, you go and practice by yourself, and Albert will practice by himself another time. Is that a command, cousin? Oh, my dear Ernst, I wouldn't think of commanding you. But I do want you to be quite at home here. And as you always practice at home, I want you to practice here and now. We shall not start our ride for another hour. That gives you just time, so do go now. Very well, cousin. Albert, remember... How oh, strangely Aunt spoke to you then. Is anything the matter? Uh, nothing serious. You haven't been quarreling, I hope. We never quarrel. I think it would be very hard to quarrel with you, Albert. I couldn't. Please don't ever try. <laughs> Some people can quarrel without trying. Yes. I suppose they like it. I suppose, too. Won't you? Won't you sit down, Albert? You're a very kind cousin. Ever since we came to... Uh, kind to of both of us, I mean. I'm very fond of... Anne. Yes, so am I. You've always been together, haven't you? We've never been apart yet. How very nice that has been for both. Would it be a great trial to you if you had to live away from him? Oh, of course, the parting would be a trial. But one would get used to it as to other things if it had to be. Mm. My life has been so different from yours. I've been so much alone, except, of course, with Mama. I don't know what it could be like to have a brother. One gets very fond of a brother. Yes. 
But one can get fonder of someone else, can one not? It happens uh, sometimes. Alfred, what are you thinking? I was listening to Ernst practicing. I can just hear him. It's Beethoven. Don't listen to Ernst. You must listen to me. I beg your pardon, cousin. I was listening. Please don't think I was inattentive. Albert, I have something to say to you. Yes. What is it, cousin? In my position, it is I who have to say it, unfortunately. Ordinarily, it is not what a woman would wish to say herself. She would rather he said it. Is there anything you wish me to say that I can say? To hear you say you can love me is all I can hope, yet. If you could say you already do love me, that would be almost like heaven. I do. I do love you, cousin. Enough to marry me? More than enough to marry you. For people in our position often marry without any love at all. I couldn't do that. Albert. Nor could I, Victoria. Then you will marry me? Oh, my dear cousin. My sweet wife that is to be. Uh, uh, aren't you going to kiss me? If I may. Again, please. Again. I pray God you do not ever have to repent of this. Repent? Oh, Albert, how could I repent? It's not in my nature. Besides, there isn't going to be time. You know, we must be married quite soon. Everybody expects, expects it. Expects it? They don't know. <laughs> no, expects me to marry, I mean. I had to choose somebody, but I wasn't going to choose anybody. Not even Ernst? Oh, I liked Ernst from the first. I do still. Is that why you sent him to practice? <laughs> he knew. That this was going to happen? No, he did not know that. What then? That you were going to ask me. Then what else could he suppose would happen? He expected me to say no. You couldn't say no to a queen, could you, Albert? No, dear. One couldn't say no to a queen. Did you want to? Oh, no, dearest one. All it means is that Ants will be disappointed. Oh, I see. Oh, poor Ants. Yes. Well, we must both try to be very nice and kind to him. And now I think it is quite time that we went for our ride. Isn't Ants to come, too? Oh, yes, of course. But then won't you send and say he may stop practicing? It hasn't taken an hour, you know. I think he has stopped. <laughs> no, has he either, for here he is. Yes, cousin. Are you ready to come riding out? Quite, if you are, cousin. Oh, yes. We are quite ready now. Everything has been settled. Tell him, Albert. Uh, Ernst, you told me to remember. I forgot. February 10th, 1840. Got up at quarter to nine, well and having slept well. Mama came, brought me a nosegay of orange flowers, wrote my journal and to Lord Melbourne, had my hair dressed and the wreath of orange flowers put on. Saw Albert for the last time alone as my bridegroom. At half past twelve I set off, dearest Albert having gone before. I wore a white satin gown with a very deep flounce of Honiton lace, imitation of old. I wore my Turkish diamond necklace and earrings, and Albert's beautiful sapphire brooch. Mama and the Duchess of Sutherland went in the carriage with me. I never saw such crowds of people as there were in the park, and they cheered us most enthusiastically. I shaved myself this morning, and I want you a ring. Yes, so hide. Hmm? Albert, may I come in? Oh, yes, dearest, if you wish to. What are you doing? Uh, shaving. Oh, how exciting. May I stay and watch you? If it would interest you, wife. Oh, cool. Oh, to see you shaving is wonderful. Something I never thought of. Oh. Do you think one did not have to shave at all? I just never thought about it till now. You know, but I've never seen a man shave himself before. No, I suppose not. How often do you have to do that? Once a week? Every day. Every day, but that's absurd. It can't grow as fast as all that. Oh, yes, it does. How very troublesome. 
I only cut my nails once a week. Nails can wait longer. Beards won't. I wouldn't like you to have a beard, Albert. <laughs> so would I. That's why I'm taking it off now. How strange it looks. And how interesting. Fascinating. Is it dangerous? Not if you don't talk to me. Oh, oh. Not just while I'm cutting myself. Cutting yourself? Oh, sorry. Oh, but you're funny. Is that not the right word? What are they, sir? Oh, really, Albert, do you know? I'm not sure. It's a part of the English language which, from not having to know, I've not been taught. Oh, Vicky, it's nice to hear you say that. And you, too, do not know the English language quite like a native. For that, if it were not for soup, I would kiss you. The soup? The uh, soup. This, I mean... Hmm. <laughs> not soup, Albert, darling. Soap. Ah, uh, soap, then. Soap. But I don't mind the soap, Albert. Your soap, if you would like to. Very well, then. I will. <laughs> now, let me see what you do it with. Oh, how sharp it is. Yes, it does have to be sharp, always. Is it hurt? No. Do you ever cut yourself? No, not when I'm alone. I had a rabbit once that used to shave me before I knew how myself. One day he cut me out of bed, and after that I had to learn. For a long time, shaved only myself. Oh, Albert, suppose you had died before we got married. Could I have ever married anyone else? Oh, of course, dear. Oh. You had to marry someone. You could not disappoint your people by not giving them an heir to the throne. Oh, Albert, shall I really? Will that really happen? We hope so, dear. In time. In time? Oh, I hope it will be very soon. Isn't it wonderful? We really are married now, aren't we? Yes, wife, yes. I think so. Yesterday seems almost like another world so different. All the crowds and the cheering and the firing and the bells... And thousands and thousands of people looking at us as if we belong to them. As, of course, in a way we do. And now we are all by ourselves. All alone. Yes, all Just alone. Just we two. <laughs> Just we two. Shall I be able to make you happy, I think? You are happy. Happy? Oh, so happy. I, I can't tell you, Albert. <laughs> and to think that this will go on for years and years. It's like heaven. Well, no, Vicky, not just like this. That is not possible. It's not human nature. But I shall never love you less than I do now, Albert. No, dear, perhaps not. But you will be less excited about it, less romantic, perhaps. No. I shall have become less strange to you. We love each other, but we are still both rather strangers. We have to learn each other's characters and ways. That will take time. Oh, yes, you've come to see me shave today for the first time. That pleases, that excites you. But it will not always excite you as much as today. You will not come, I think, to see me shave every day for the next 20 years. Why not? Oh, it should become less of a spectacle. It's only reasonable. I don't want to be reasonable with you, Albert. Oh, but you will want. In time, I hope, Vicky. And so shall I. We have a great life of duties to perform, in which I am to share. Is that not so? We can't share everything, Albert. Some things I shall have to do alone, you know. Affairs of state, in which it would not be right for you to concern yourself. So? Oh, yes. We must take great care, dearest. The English are jealous, and to them you are still a foreigner. And to you? To me, you are everything. <laughs> listening to the Campbell Playhouse presentation of Victoria Regina, starring Helen Hayes with Orson Welles. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. We resume our Campbell Playhouse presentation of Victoria Regina, starring Helen Hayes with Orson Welles. May 6, 1840. My dearest angel, Albert, is indeed a great comfort to me. He takes the greatest interest in what goes on, feeling with and for me. We talk much together, and his judgment is always good. Vicky! Ah, here you are, Albert. I was wondering when you would come. 
after 10 o'clock. You did not think I had forgotten. No, I only thought you were a little late, as you are. Oh, just one minute. I do not yet quite know to realize how long at Windsor it shall take to get from one place to another. It is all very grand and large, is it not? It is. But that is what we in our position have to put up with. Wouldn't it be rather nice to make one corner of it for our own? How do you mean our own? It is all ours, Alfred. More private. Well, well, no one can come but ourselves. I, I mean, you know, during the day. Where by ourselves you could sing to me, I could play to you and read to you. you know? Yes, Alfred, that is just what I should love. I shall have it arranged for. Will you not let me do it? My own way? You think I will not do it as you wish, Albert? Oh, not so at all, but this I would just like to do myself. At present, it seems there's so little I may do. But you do a great deal, dearest. Everything that I want you to do. Yes, and that is all. Is that not enough? What is the matter? I could wish that you wanted me to do a little more, Vicky, in my own way. What else can you do? Who knows? Shall you let me try? There's so many things here that want doing badly. God knows. Dearest. You judge people so strictly. But do I? Of course you do, and sometimes it's rather inconvenient, you know. Well, for instance? The other night when Uncle Augustus came in after dinner, having dined elsewhere. And, of course, he dined well, as usual. And so almost at once you sent one of your gentlemen in your compliments and told him that it was, this carriage was waiting. Do you wish that I had let him stay? I, I think you should have come to me before doing anything. Well, why? For permission, that you might have my authority. Oh, no, Vicky, I'm not going to ask permission for everything. Do you mean that? Oh, very much so. I mean it. Oh, but is this going to be the first time you've disobeyed me? Well, perhaps it should have come earlier. It will not be the last. Albert, you forget yourself. Vicky, do you, do you wish that I had let Uncle Augustus stay? Well, Albert, after all, he is an old man. We can't expect to alter him now. Even your uncle should be made to respect you. But they do, I'm sure. It was not respectful for him to come as he came the other night. It would not have been had he realized, had he known... How drunk he was. Albert, he is my uncle. Please don't use such a common expression about one of us. Is it too common, that word said in English? Forgive me, I will say it in German. No, Albert. Till you know it better, you must please still speak in English. And it's the same about English ways and customs. You must get to know them better and be more like the rest of us. You wish me to become English? Why, of course. I am English, so my husband must be English, too. That one should have begun earlier. I married you as soon as ever I could, Albert. Oh, by so long as you do not repent it. You are happy, Albert. I will be more than happy so long as serving you, I'm able to make a life worth living. But you must let me serve you, not feel myself useless. You? Sometimes I feel that I'm put, not quite in a corner, but on the shelf just a little. Who does that? You, my dear. I? Oh, I worship you, Albert. Too much. Let me come down to earth a little now, then. Give my hands and brains something to do so that I may be able to respect myself. Am I only your plating? Am I never to help or advise you? Never. From your life's work, am I always to be shut out? But you do help me so much. Well, let me help you now. How? Let me see some of those papers you spent so long over. Oh. I could read them for you, make a few notes. That would save you time. Oh, I... but I must see everything myself. That is what I am here for. Cannot you rely upon me a little... Albert, dearest, you distress me. In every way that is possible, I do rely on you. And in everything that I have had to decide for you, I've only done it for your own good. Yes, you even choose my secretary for me. Well, of course, Albert. Uh -huh. How could you know, coming here, a stranger who would be the best? Who reports to you regularly, I believe. Surely you don't mind my knowing. I would prefer to tell you myself what I do. In future, well, I mean to. Of course. I always wish to hear everything. Yes. The other day I made an engagement. You canceled it. Yes, you wish to hear everything. I had a very good reason for doing so. You see? Not only do you not give me your confidence, but you have me watched. Tomorrow I'm going to choose another secretary for myself. Albert, you are making a great mistake. I am repairing a great mistake. I ought to have done this before. You are not to do it, Albert. I say you are not to do it. Then, then for the present, I leave you. Where are you going? In here, to my own room. To write my own letters. Oh! Open the door. Your wife 
wife, Albert. Your poor, unhappy little wife. Oh, Albert. Albert. Oh, shush, wife. Don't cry. Don't cry. It's all right. It's all right. I think so. Then go along and get Her Majesty's breakfast. Quick and shop. Is Your Majesty awake? Yes, nurse. I'm awake. At least I'm going to be. What time is it? Six o'clock, Your Majesty. Morning? Yes, oh. Your Majesty. It's morning now. Your Majesty has had six hours good sleep. And you'll have another after Your Majesty has had her breakfast. I don't think I want any breakfast. Not yet. No, Your Majesty. But Your breakfast wants you. Mm. Not till I've seen the prince. Your Majesty can't see His Royal Highness the Prince till you've had your breakfast. No, it's the doctor's orders. Uh, then let me have it at once. Why, here it is. Bring it in, nurse, and put it down. What's that? That's what we call a feeding cup, Your Majesty. It's the same one Her Royal Highness the Duchess had when Your Majesty was born. Yes, oh, yes, the same one. Does Your Majesty hear the bells ringing? What are they ringing for? What for? Why, for the princess, to be sure. The princess? Oh, yes, of course. Oh, I do so want to see the prince. Nurse, go and say that his royal highness can come now. There. Now I've sent word. His royal highness will be here in another minute. Tidy me, nurse. Tidy me. How do I look? Your majesty looks very nice indeed. Just a little pale, but that's to be expected. Let me look at myself. Oh, nurse, I look dreadful. You don't, ma'am. You look sweet and like a mother. How's baby? Oh, she's all right. Your Majesty needn't worry about her. She's having a 24-hour sleep and having it well. 24 hours sleep? Impossible. No, Your Majesty. It's what babies always have to do when they first come, to get over the shock. The shock of what? Of being born, Your Majesty. It's hard treatment they get sometimes, poor wee thing. Did she have very hard treatment? No. Your Majesty treated her beautifully, like as if she'd been the mother of 12. Oh, you must lie still and not talk till His Royal Highness the Prince comes. When he does come, nurse, you must go. Go, Your Majesty? Yes, I wish to see him alone. But I mustn't go, Your Majesty. It's doctor's order. This is Queen's order. You will do as I tell you. Well, I, I've never done such a thing before, but if Your Majesty really means it... I really mean it, nurse. Well, here His Highness is, then. Mrs. Nurse. How long may I stay? Only five minutes, Your Royal Highness, please. Very well. Oh, oh. oh Albert, darling. Have I disappointed you? Disappointed me? But how? Why, Weifkin? That it wasn't a boy. You wished it to be a boy. Oh, but of course. <laughs> how could one have wished anything else to an heir to the throne? The heir to a throne must be a boy, if possible. Well, Vicky, if I did not know that it was always to be, for if, if you had been your brother instead of yourself, this would not have happened. This? I mean that I should not have then married you. Then you're not disappointed. Oh, there's plenty of time. Vicky, you may yet be a mother of twelve. <laughs> that's what Nurse said. Oh, did she? Well, let's hope that she was right. Oh, hmm. no, Albert, I, I don't want to have twelve. Not quite. You see, it would be such an interruption to my being queen. Oh, yes, I suppose, mm. but mm. while that was so, I could be looking after things for you, perhaps. No? No. No, mm. Albert, that would never do. My people wouldn't like it. So? No. Two or three will be quite enough, I think. Perhaps I wouldn't mind four in time. So you really don't mind. Oh, how good you are to me. I was so afraid I hadn't quite done my duty. Well, Vicky. If it's anyone's fault, it is my fault, too. Oh, no, no. No, Albert, no. The father has nothing to do with whether it's a boy or a girl. Oh, indeed. You seem to be very learned on the subject, Vicky. You surprised me. I thought it was something nobody knew anything about. Oh, yes, I'm quite sure of it. <laughs> I've thought so much about it, you see, lately. So I know. Uh, oh, Vicky, it's time I went. The nurse told me it was only five minutes I was to be here. The nurse told you? Yes, and she was quite right. It was doctor's orders. And when doctor's order, kings and queens must obey. Oh. So now for a little goodbye. Hmm? Kiss me again. Again? No, 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 not again. You must not so excite yourself. Goodbye. Albert. Goodbye. 
Have I been more than five minutes, nurse? No? Oh, it's a little hard to obey. And now, if you will let me, I'd like to look at the Royal Highness the Princess. She's in here, Your Royal Highness. Uh, Please. Be careful. You can't wake me. You think it's quite safe? Quite safe. If Your Royal Highness will allow me to go in first. All this right. way. Oh, Vicky, what a thing to be What is wondering? Oh, oh he's <laughs> oh, well, dearest, if you want twelve, you shall have them. Anything, anything to please you. But, oh, I do wish it had been a boy. A boy. Street, 9th of January, 1862. Viscount Palmerston presents his humble duty to your majesty and begs to state that the cabinet, at its meeting this afternoon, considered Mr. Seward's note announcing the refusal of the federal government of the United States to release your majesty's subjects, Messrs. Slidell and Mason. After long deliberation, the cabinet then decided to send an ultimatum to the American government, informing them that unless immediate compliance is made with the wishes of your majesty's government... This looks very serious indeed, General Gray. Where's the messenger from the Foreign Office? Well, he's gone, Your Majesty. Gone? Without waiting? He waited for an hour, ma'am, so I'm told. I know. He should have waited all day if necessary. Messengers from my other ministers know that they have to wait. Why do not Foreign Office messengers wait too? Cannot one of Your Majesty's messengers go, ma'am? The matter being so urgent? Yes, he must, of course. Tell one of them to be ready to start instantly. Yes, Your Majesty. Albert... Yes, Vicky. Send for me. Oh, Albert, why did you wait to change? I've been so wanting you. It's after four. My uniform is wet, so my dear. I'm feeling very cold. You're cold still, dearest. Your mm. hand is like ice. Oh, why did you go to Sandhurst in such weather when I begged oh, you I not to? Oh, not to, my dear. What's the matter? It's about that trouble with America. They're having taken the Confederate envoys off one of our ships. Mm. And most wrong it was of them, you know. This is the dispatch Lord Russell is sending to our ambassador in Washington about it. He wants it to go tonight. Is the messenger waiting? No. He's gone. Gone. Well, that's what it's not now to expect, I suppose. Yes, it's that Palmerston again, troublesome man. Uh, Albert, read it quickly. I want you to. I want to know what you think about it. This means war. Oh, I was afraid so. How foolish of them not to give in! For they must know they are in the wrong, and everything that Lord Palmerston says there is true, is it not? Quite, quite. It won't do. But Albert. As we are in the right, what else can we do? Alter a few words, say it, but say it differently. Often it's just the way a thing is said that decides whether it shall be peace or war. It's the same when two people quarreled. You and I, Viking, might often have quarreled. Had we said the same thing that we did say differently. But we could always beat America now, Albert. Ah, uh -huh, so. What if we were fighting someone else, Vicky? And America chose her time then, no. That is what these patriots never think about. It is always this time, this time we are right and we shall do what we like. Oh, what fools their patriotism makes clever men to be. And Palmerston, the cleverest fool of them all, when he dies, they would say of this man, oh, yes, he had his faults, but he always upheld the honor of his country. When they say honor, they mean pride. For honor means that you are too proud to do wrong. But pride means that you will not own that you have done wrong at all. That's the difference. Then what are we going to do, Albert? We're going to alter this dispatch now, Vicky. Sit down at once and write. Say that yes. this dispatch is not to go till he has heard from you, and your messenger must go now at once and must see Lord Farmerston himself. This will take me more time, but you write your letter at once. Yes, I am, Albert. I am. And now will you leave me alone, my dear, yes. while I draft this letter to America for you? Yes, Albert, dear. Majesty, that I finished this letter for America. Ask Your Majesty to come at once. Yes, Your Royal Highness. Albert. Oh, what's the matter, Albert? Are you ill? I've done. Read it, Vicky. If you approve, send it. Yes, yes, yes. Of course. Oh, I do. 
I do approve every word. Then let it go. No. Yes. And, uh, Vicky, there's one thing. <laughs> Albert. Oh. What's the matter, dear? You look so pale. What is it? Take me to bed. Take the bed. Oh, I feel... I feel so weak. I feel... I've come to feed a hot and cold. Albert. Albert! <laughs> To lose one's partner in life is like losing half of one's body and soul, torn forcibly away. But to a queen, to a poor, helpless woman, it is not that only. It is the stay, support, and comfort which is lost. To the queen, it is like death in life. Great and small, nothing was done without his loving advice and help. And she feels alone in the wide world. Twentieth, eighteen ninety-seven, Windsor Castle. This eventful day has opened, and I pray God to help and protect me as He has hitherto done during these sixty long eventful years. <laughs> How well I remember this day sixty years ago, when I was called from my bed by dear Mama to receive the news of my accession. Her Majesty the Queen. Congratulations, Your Majesty. Thank you, Mardi. How are you? I, I'm very tired. But very happy. Oh, to think now that it is all over. I'm so glad that I had the strength for it. And the courage, Mama. Dear. <laughs> you were quite wonderful, Mama. Thank you, dear. Thank you. No, Mama, I think you had better take a glass of wine. It will do you good. Oh, certainly, certainly. And may we also drink to your good health, Mama. Oh, yes, yes, certainly. Please, all of you. But last, Your Majesty. What is it? Champagne, Mama. No, no. I will have sherry. Yes, Your Majesty. How long did the procession take? Nearly three hours, Mama. Oh, dear me, dear me. <laughs> and it seems like yesterday and tomorrow almost. Three hours. Your Imperial and Royal Highnesses, I have great pleasure in asking you to drink to the health of Her Majesty the Queen. May she continue long in health and prosperity to enjoy the love of her children and her people. Her, her Majesty, Majesty the Queen. Queen. Thank you. Thank you. Won't you go and rest now, Mama? No, I won't. That cheering that I heard means that my dear people are expecting to see me again. I must try not to disappoint them. It would be nice if you could, Mama. You think you can? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I shall have to go as I am, you know. I can't get up. I can't, can't get up. Oh, have the windows open. Now, will you, Bertie, and some of the others go out and let them know that I'm coming? No, not too many, just a few. Just yes, no. Very well, now. Lift me up, please. There. There. That is enough. That is enough. Lower me Close the window. <laughs> it is very gratifying, very, to find after all these years that they do appreciate all that I have tried to do for them, for their good, and for this dear country of ours. We've been so near together today, they and I, all my dear people of England and Scotland and Wales and Ireland and the dear colonies and India. From all over the world I have had messages, you know. Such loyalty and such devotion. It's most extraordinary. Bertie, will you tell Mr. Chamberlain how very much I approve all the arrangements he has made for the proper representation of all parts of my empire in the procession. Everything was in perfect order. 
Very gratifying. Very. I'm so happy. Oh, Bertie. Bertie, if we were coming back, you were in front, and I don't think you saw this. It was just at Hyde Park Corner. There was a great crowd there, you know, and a lot of rough-looking men. Of course, it ought never to have happened, but it didn't matter, really. Broke right through the lines of the police and the troops guarding the route, and they ran along beside the carriage, shouting and cheering me, and I heard them say, Go it, old girl, you've done it well. <laughs> Of course, they're very unsuitable the word, but very gratifying. And oh, I hope it's true. I hope it's true. Hearts, they are still cheering. Oh, Albert. Albert, if only you could have been here. concludes the Campbell Playhouse presentation of Victoria Regina, starring Helen Hayes with Orson Welles. In just a moment, both stars will return to our microphone, but first a word from our sponsors. I told you how Campbell's chicken soup reminded me so vividly of the old-fashioned homemade soup I had as a child. I think when you have Campbell's chicken soup, it will remind you, too, of the best you ever tasted. I'm sure of this because, truly, I don't see how a chicken soup could be better made than Campbell's. Into it goes all the good meat of plump, tender chickens. Chickens carefully selected and then approved by United States government inspectors. The broth is simmered slowly till it bubbles with good, deep chicken flavor all through. And tender morsels of chicken meat are added generously, along with fine, fluffy rice. I say again that just as sure as you like chicken, you like Campbell's chicken soup. I think that you like it just as much as the finest chicken soup you ever tasted and that you'll want to have it often. That's why I do urge you to try it soon, to plan on having Campbell's Chicken Soup this very weekend. And now, Orson Welles. Ladies and gentlemen, you've met Miss Helen Hayes on this program not so many weeks ago. Now, Miss Hayes won't let me tell you all I want to about what I think of her, Victoria. On this point, she's quite obstinate. But just before she says hello, I would like to tell her how very much her visits here have meant to us on the Campbell Playhouse. Thanks, Orson. I'm sure all our audience will understand why it's such a joy to an actress to return to your broadcast. You've done a great deal for radio on the Campbell Playhouse. And speaking just as one of your listeners, and I'm a faithful one, I'd like to say that we'll all miss you this summer. That's sweet of you, Helen. Now, before we say goodbye, let me remind you that you have a date with us here in the Campbell Playhouse next September. I couldn't forget that, Austin. I'm looking forward to it. You're going to let me pick the play I most want to do. That's a promise. And ladies and gentlemen, this is my cue to say goodbye. For tonight, with Victoria Regina, the Campbell Playhouse ends its present season. For us, it's been an eventful procession of varied and interesting Friday nights. And we hope that in some measure it's been so for you, too that we've lived up to our aim expressed on our first Campbell Playhouse broadcast, that we've pleased most of you most of the time. And we have news for you, too. The Campbell Playhouse will be back on the air in September after a summer of searching for the best stories and plays that we can find for you. So until then, until September, our sponsors, the makers of Campbell Soups, and all of us here in the Campbell Playhouse, remain, as always, obediently yours. Tonight's broadcast of Victoria Regina, starring Helen Hayes with Orson Welles, concludes this present season of the Campbell Playhouse. Beginning in September, the Campbell Playhouse, Orson Welles' producer, will bring you a new series of great dramatic presentations with a long list of celebrated guest stars. In the meantime, our good friend Raymond Page, who played for us so many years, brings his latest program, 99 Men and a Girl, brings it to you at this same time next Friday. If you have enjoyed our Campbell Playhouse presentations, won't you tell your grocer so... When you order Campbell's chicken soup, this is Ernest Chappell saying thank you and good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.